So um, welcome everyone to Parallel Session 3 on Sustainable and Inclusive Learning. My name is Della Burke. I'm the coordinator of Campus Internationalization at ITESO, the Jesuit University of Guadalajara in Mexico. I'm interested in contributing to dialogues which address COIL and other virtually connected classroom initiatives as a way to strengthen sustainable and inclusive learning. At ITESO, we're now reaching more students through COIL and globally networked classroom initiatives than any other internationalization effort. And the fact that these collaborations are free for students opens internationalization benefits to a larger population. Equitable internationalization should also be considered at the partnering level. Through COIL at ITESO, we see more equity within our professor-professor collaborations. Like many Mexican universities, we partner with universities who have far more resources than us, as well as those with far fewer resources. Equity and partnering does not mean everyone offers the same, but that everyone offers what they are able. To achieve this, we encourage strong and reliable partnerships by engaging in multiple projects in a variety of departments with key collaborators, thus leading to more sustainable collaborations. Finally, we know that it is unlikely that the majority of our students enroll in international master's degree programs or land international jobs. However, it is very likely that our graduates will work in companies with teams in other parts of the world. We are focused on providing skills for our graduates so that they may excel in these companies and have competences to work on international virtual teams, which is inc an increasing reality in the workforce, <clears throat> pandemic or no pandemic. In this panel, we will look at the question of sustainable and inclusive learning by considering the question, who gets to participate in internationalization? As our panel participants will speak to personal engagement with sustainable and inclusive learning, this may take the form of international interventions in the arts, government strategies, and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Through the initiatives to be discussed, we will look at how to encourage professors and students to address the SDGs or other issues related to sustainability and include more and diverse voices in internationalization. The return of in-person internationalization is an opportunity to further knit together diverse internationalization efforts so that they are more collaborative and more integrated into the curriculum. And with that, I would like to introduce the first part of our panel. Um, so the first group uh, to speak will include Professor Javier Cortada, who is a professor of uh, practice and artist. He's in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Miami College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Gabriela Heron, the Director of Partnerships, Innovation and Communications at the Hemispheric and Global Affairs at the University of Miami. And Dr. David Huerta Harris, International Experiences and Models Director in the Vice Rectory for International Affairs at Tec de Monterrey. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, everyone. Good afternoon and greetings from Bogota, Colombia. And of course, as Dali was mentioning here, we are thrilled. Please let me just know that you are you can see my screen. Perhaps no? Okay. Let me see. Let me try again. And I think that I'm gonna be able to do it now. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Wonderful, thank you so much. Again, we are thrilled to be here today with all of you uh, as part of this international and global conference. We are thrilled to be here. Thank you so much first to York University and all the partners that are really leading this conversation and putting us in a very high level. Um, we are here today to share about our this incredible partnership that we have been doing for two years and with my colleagues from Tecnológico de Monterrey and University of Miami, and also as part of this collaboration that we had with the Hemisphere University Consortium that I'm gonna share with you. We're gonna be sharing about reflecting on empathy throughout social engaged art. This is a way that we are uh, internationalization experience for our students in more engaging and meaningful and inclusive ways. And you will learn more about this. So first, of course, Everything that we are doing is in the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, especially uh, for this uh, workshop, we really relate with the SDG number four, 
and the target number four seven. That is education for sustainable development and global citizenship. This is precisely where with this workshop we have been doing really develop these competences in our students globally, because the uh, target it really talks about that, right? Like by 2030, what we want is to ensure that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including among others, throughout education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of culture, peace, no violence, global citizen, and appreciation of cultural diversity. You will hear and you will learn later more about this workshop, how our students have been really engaging in these conversations and really being and being during this virtual environment to become global citizens, citizens and be part and be in the shoes of other students. And that, of course, contributes to the culture and sustainable development as a whole. So this collaboration has been in the framework of our partnership that we have in the Hemisphere University Consortium. We have, we are 13 universities across the hemisphere. You can see here at the top, some of the, the, the universities that are part of the consortium. York University is part of our partners, eh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, University de Miami, etc. So in this uh, uh, initiative that we have, we actually, we have uh, recently renamed it in order to really show the different virtual mobility programs that we have been creating just to provide more opportunities for our students to engage in, in globally. So now this uh, initiative, is the name is Hemisphere University Consortium, Global Learning Experiences and Engagement. So everything is starting with COIL, that is Collaborative Online International Learning, that is a very common and very solid model. But later, every university was able to bring different programs like uh, Tech de Monterrey that we're going to talk now about Global Week. We also have been implementing virtual mobility programs with your university. We are part of the International Indigenous Student Exchange Program. Of course, the GNE, the Network Learning Initiative. Tech de Monterrey with the uh, Global Classroom, uh, Universidad San Francisco de Quito with Chief Academy, helping and sharing resources for all of us to uh, train our professors. So it has been amazing all the collaborations that we have been doing through all this environment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to really focus on specific this, to share about this workshop in the context of the Tech de Monterrey Global Week. David. Thank you so much, Gabriela. And just let me continue uh, just sharing that in Tecta Monterrey, we have embarked in a, a very fascinating journey to try to rethink education. And one of the um, uh, discoveries or, or the implementations we've done is that we have changed a lot of the traditional ways we have been educating our students. Uh, just to mention one example, we have changed the way our semester is structured. So now uh, students pause after one third of their semester and they are regrouped uh, in in um, new classes that are interdisciplinary classes so we have students from medical school paired with students from the humanities engineering and they focus on uh, developing very precise transversal competencies that we believe are going to be equip them to um, face the 21st century challenges one of those is uh, courses that is one week long, is the Diversity in the Globalized World course, where we try to help the students develop uh, social intelligence as the main competence, but also to focus on diversity at a basic level. So students uh, from Tech de Monterrey need to learn about diversity as an enriching element of their personal and professional lives, but also be able to understand uh, what it means and how it can be useful in, in solving the, the challenges they are facing and will face in the future. Next, please. Um, Gabriela, thank you. So uh, they do have to go through some, some content, learn about human rights, about stereotypes, about diversity in general. But what we are mostly focused on is in the attitudinal part. So we want them not just to learn, but also to experience uh, and be actually challenged by the interactions that they can have between themselves, but also with students from other parts of the world, of course, being exposed to great examples of professors, mentors, 
uh, visitors, uh, special guests. So we do uh, this uh, by a format that is called Global Shared Learning Week, which actually links this one week course that is offered widely in Tec de Monterrey with our partner universities. And we have been fortunate to work closely with University of Miami. We got together in the consortium and we started sharing ideas. And we had the uh, wonderful uh, opportunity to work with Professor Javier Cortada. And I will pass it on to him uh, to continue the presentation. Great, thank you so much, David. Uh, it's an honor to be here with my colleagues. And it's a very familiar place to be doing this across um, the internet. In fact, I have yet to meet David, but have collaborated on a handful of projects uh, with him. And I do believe that our ability to use the internet to connect globally and share ideas and to use the value of technology as a way of uh, helping us um, address the challenges of our time is what we are called to do. I am an artist, a socially engaged artist, and I use arts elasticity to work across disciplines in order to engage communities in problem solving. If we go to the next slide, you'll see how I've tried to do this in a handful of capacities using the most traditional of methods, the idea of collaborative painting. The very first image is uh, one of my international AIDS murals in South Africa, where I wanted to capture uh, the pain and anguish of Africans in the year 2000, when the International AIDS Conference was there, uh, and record what was happening in face of that pandemic. 20 years later, as we globally are enduring another pandemic, we continue to rely on art as a way of engaging issues. The pictures in the middle deal with environmental issues, some of them in classrooms and community meetings across universities, all of them whether it's the murals or the interactive pieces, have a participatory component. It is essential to me. Art has this wonderful way of reframing the way we think and clearly by being in that interstitial space where different disciplines get out of their silos and they communicate with one another, I do believe that we encourage, in fact, animate innovation. And our goal is to allow these students to tap into their own creativity stuff we model is aimed at them tapping into their own creativity so that they can find creative approaches to the impact that humans are having in our global climate. And the last image there is an image of me at the South Pole, where years ago in 2006, I created a series of installations as part of the National Science Foundation, and then repurpose them as participatory art projects that normally happened in real time with real people in a physical space, but thanks to this beautiful relationship of ours has happened magically in a virtual way. And the last slide I wanna show you talks to you about the longitudinal installation. I uh, So the last slide shows uh, the work we did. I won't read that for you. I'll just literally explain the project while you read that. But I put 24 shoes around a circle at the very location where all the longitudes converged. And I walked around almost as a metaphor for stepping in the shoes of 24 people from those 24 time zones and spoke the words that they had spoken to journalists about how climate was impacting their communities 15 years ago in 2006, 2007. Through our project, we had our students assume the role across Asia and Latin America, right, and Europe, assume the role of those 24 individuals, learn about the, the climate crisis issue, learn about the culture, and see where we are today when it comes to climate, repeat the quotes as part of the longitudinal installation, and then come up with their 25th quote, their own idea on how they're seeing our climate being impacted. And I created this conceptually back before the internet was doing its thing, as a way of creating proximity between people. The longitudes converge at the South Pole coming to zero. Well, guess what? We don't need to take me to the South Pole to do that. We literally create proximity and bring our students together through this global learning, through all, all of us coming together and using technology. And Tech de Monterrey has been a stellar partner to this, the University of Miami, in bringing communities together and having 
students from across different countries and hemispheres understand that we're all in this together. The very same point I tried to make at the point where all the longitudes converged. Next slide. I mean, go ahead. Thank you so much, Javier. And you can imagine that we would have loved to have uh, Javier with us and perform face-to-face -face this performance uh, with our students in the classrooms, but we had the pandemic. So we had, as has been mentioned, to find ways to conduct this uh, great exercise, participatory exercise on online with our students at home. So we uh, connected this idea with Global Week and we had uh, students uh, look for a site where there was a lot of information so they could become familiar with Javier's work and also start working on their 25th quote because that was part of the idea, not just to read the quotes of the people around the world, but also construct their own vision about climate change and how it was affecting them and their communities. And we also invited students from different university, universities to get together and practice the performance virtually. They did a marvelous job. They worked uh, with their uh, back screens and Zoom, simulating the places where the quotes came from, and they prepared to perform during our collaborative session. In one day of the week, we got all together. We had the chance to meet with Javier and have a lecture about socially engaged art. And then we move right to the participation of our students to then break them up in groups for further discussion and reflection. And they also contributed with their 21st, 25th quote, quote sorry, to provide a more holistic view of how the class, the group involved was experiencing uh, climate change. Uh, finally, uh, during the class uh, at Tec de Monterrey, they follow up and they did uh, reflective exercises and also they were able to post on their media uh, some of their uh, conclusions and, and, and findings. So um, up to now, we have uh, already had 400 four, uh, students involved from 31 majors, from 12 universities represented and uh, this has been wonderful because we have been able to connect with Asia, with, uh, of course, here in America, but also with European universities. And the students that are participating in the performance and also being part of the discussion groups are from several places in the world. And uh, we believe, to, to end, that this is a way to provide what we think is a meaningful virtual experience for our students. It's very active. It's hands-on. Students have to engage. Uh, they also need to learn and construct some of the ideas that they had and contrast them with people around the world. It's highly intentional. We want to, of course, uh, ask them to be respectful, to be to, to, talk, to, to be open to other views. Um, it's authentic because they are bringing their own, their own community problems and uh, challenges to the session. And also it's highly uh, cooperative. They work collaborative in this initiative. So this is what we uh, have been doing recently. And uh, thank you so much. We look forward to, to uh, questions from the audience later. Thank you very much. This is all very interesting. Okay, so next I would like to uh, bring to the, the, the uh, stage as it were, uh, Andrew Champagne. Andrew is the manager of the Mobility Program for Colleges and Institutes Canada. So, Andrew, please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Della. Thank you uh, to the other panelists for, for that wonderful presentation. Um, perhaps, Shirley, if you can bring up the presentation, that might be, might be easier, in fact. Or I'll try and share. You've got it. Great. Thank you so much. So um, we can move on uh, straight away to the next slide. But basically, you know, I'm here to talk to you a little bit more uh, at a macro level about a, a concerted effort by the Canadian government to promote global learning uh, and to help students develop intercultural skills and competencies through their post-secondary education um, by engaging in international study and work uh, abroad opportunities. Uh, first, I just want to do a very brief introduction uh, to the association that I work for, Colleges and Institutes Canada. Uh, we are a national membership-based organization uh, representing colleges, polytechnics, institutes of technologies, uh, CEGEPs, um, 
all institutions that focus on technical, vocational, professional education, uh, really emphasizing uh, skill acquisition um, and uh, labor market, uh, strong labor market transitions. So uh, large national network campuses all across Canada, um, most accessible network uh, in Canada, 95% of Canadians live within 50 kilometers of one of our member institutions. Uh, if we go to the next slide, just to present a little bit of uh, our, our raison d'être. So we are an advocacy organization. Uh, we drive knowledge and build capacity. Um, there's a lot of interesting work that we do uh, internationally to help strengthen education systems abroad, um, basically helping to um, um, export uh, education services and strengthen uh, the ability of technical and vocational education systems uh, to be responsive to labor market needs. We do a lot of work internationally. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, just to put into perspective, um, our, our our strategy at the international level. Uh, we are really looking to future-proof Canada in the world, bring Canada to the world, and take uh, Canada to the world. Um, we are uh, very involved in um, all things to do with internationalization, whether that be student mobility, uh, international development, uh, cooperation projects. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you today uh, is what you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen, and that is enhancing outbound student mobility. And there's a very particular project uh, called Global Skills Opportunity. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, that is just that. This is the Government of Canada's Outbound Student Mobility Pilot Program, um, a part of its international education strategy. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see that this is a, a long time coming. Um, there were initially calls in uh, 2012 when the Government of Canada, the Department of Global Affairs more specifically, uh, was doing widespread consultation on what a first international education strategy for Canada should look like. Um, at the time, there were notions of, of you know, further inviting international students to come study in Canada, but also to reciprocate and develop a program that would would uh, encourage up to 50,000 Canadian students uh, to study and work abroad by the year 2022. Um, unfortunately, the latter of those two recommendations was not picked up at the time, uh, and there were a series of, of, of calls on behalf of uh, you know, business leaders, civil society, stakeholders, um, to really reinvest in this space. Uh, and in 2019, there was a $95 million commitment um, to develop uh, an outbound student mobility program uh, in order to uh, do exactly what I what I mentioned at the beginning, and that is to, to help students develop those intercultural skills and and competencies. So if we move on to the next slide, um, uh, again, so just big picture targets. We are uh, implementing this project on behalf of the government of Canada. Uh, in fact, the Department of Employment and Social Development Canada, uh, which is very focused on skills development, and we have very um, high-level objectives to support up to 11,000 students, college and university students, um, uh, to have these opportunities over over the four uh, five years of the program. Uh, the next slide, you'll see just a bit of how this is all structured. So we have our international education strategy, which is a shared responsibility between the Department of Global Affairs, uh, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, uh, and Employment and Social Development Canada. We manage this program um, in collaboration with our sister organization called Universities Canada. Um, and it is a decentralized um, program in that, you know, we launch, uh, you know, we request um, uh, proposals for, for mobility projects um, that are then funded at the institutional level. The institutions uh, have a, a fair degree of flexibility to develop those projects, seek international partners, um, develop the right kinds of supports and services that their students need, uh, and that funding ultimately flows uh, to students in order to support their participation. If we can go to the next slide. So really, when we look at the objectives, uh, there are threefold for this program. Uh, one is to uh, include, and that is very much widening access and equity to participation in outbound student mobility programming, uh, to diversify uh, some of the destination countries where Canadian students choose to study or work abroad, 
uh, and to innovate. And and I think that last pillar uh, is 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 quite important. Certainly in the context of uh, of the pandemic, um, it's uh, you know I laugh about it now, but this program was announced in 2019. We had um, intended to launch it uh, nationally on April 1st, 2020. Uh, which, of course, um, there could not have been a worse time to launch a, an outbound student mobility program in, in hindsight. Um, but what that meant is that we really took a step back, um, you know, looked at all the consultation that we had done with our colleges and universities and thought about how we can be innovative in order to move forward with this program, uh, start developing early results um, and, uh, and, and work towards the objectives uh, that, we, that we have. Um, Everything that we do here at Colleges and Institutes Canada is done within the framework of the Sustainable De Development Goals. Uh, of course, you know, really focusing on quality education, um, uh, economic growth and prosperity, and, and reducing inequalities. And these are all areas that this program uh, supports um, in, in, various, uh, in various ways. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. And again, just to further emphasize some of the targets, um, you know, we uh, have a mandate from Employment and Social Development Canada to um, uh, deploy 50% of our funding uh, to supporting uh, students from target groups. And what this means in the context of this program uh, is Indigenous students, students with disabilities, and students from low-income families. Um, so we really need to be intentional uh, about this. We often hear from our colleges and universities that this is the 95% of students that typically um, does not participate or did not participate uh, in, in global learning opportunities for a wide variety of reasons, financial being just one of them. Uh, this program, of course, reduces some of the financial barriers, but also um, provides some funding to institutions to help develop wraparound services and supports uh, in order to encourage that participation. Um, again, you know, Canadian students um, pre-2019, uh, you know, uh, our data uh, and, and that of our sister organization, Universities Canada, suggests that only about 3% of college students um, participated in international study or work um, uh, opportunities in the context of their post-secondary education, uh, and that figure was about 11% at the university level. Um, now, this is significantly lower than some of our um, sort of like-minded countries. Uh, when we look at Australia, where that figure approaches 20%, of course, Europe uh, well beyond, uh, and even, uh, of course, the United States, um, we see a lot more uh, engagement globally. So um, the intention really was to try and encourage Canadian students to go to countries that are are perhaps a little bit less familiar to them. Um, so not the United States necessarily, or the UK, France, Australia, um, but to explore uh, new destinations, destinations that are important from a Government of Canada perspective in terms of people to people ties, um, but also destinations that could really, um, you know, take students out of their comfort zone and help to, to really uh, develop some of those intercultural skills and competencies. When we talk about the 10% funding for innovation, uh, this, to be very frank, was sort of the, this was the lifeline um, that we were able to deploy uh, throughout the early years of the pandemic. And uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll, you'll be able to see that um, we sort of pivoted um, or adjusted our approach. Uh, and instead of going out with our planned large call for mobility projects, um, we launched the call for innovative projects. Uh, and these were largely non-mobility related um, uh, projects focusing on um, you know, research to reduce barriers to participation, uh, some uh, programming, you know, adapting to virtual modalities, um, ways to better recruit um, and encourage participation uh, from our underrepresented students. Um, and, um, you know, we saw with great success uh, over 107 Canadian post-secondary institutions participate uh, in that innovative funding round, uh, working on a total of 130 projects. Um, we have a, a great inventory of tools and resources that were developed as a result. Um, but what this also did was really push the boundaries of the policy direction that we had uh, from the Canadian government, where, um, you know, we consulted with our colleges and universities as we were developing uh, the guidelines for this program. And we heard very loudly that, you know, um, uh, virtual means of, of, of delivering these kinds of programs um, 
are a way to reduce barriers to, to participation, certainly for uh, some of the target group students that we're, we're looking at in the context of global skills opportunity. Um, unfortunately, at the time, uh, the Canadian government uh, w was not uh, keen on, uh, on on supporting virtual opportunities. It was very much a uh, program that was 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 underpinned by this notion of uh, that the travel itself being the uh, the element that really um, pushes or uh, encourages the development of of some of these global competencies. Now, of course, as a result of the pandemic, uh, we were able to advocate for the the necessary policy change to allow for virtual participation to be uh, funded. Um, and we are now seeing a, a great deal of innovation, um, whether that be through, you know, through COIL projects, through um, um, uh, sort of, you know, simulations between uh, between programs uh, and and uh, really looking at how virtual um, mobility can be a, a stepping stone uh, to further further physical opportunities. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, and uh, this just gives you a sense of the, the the colleges in Canada who are implementing projects, but maybe we'll move on to the next one, which is a bit of a um, a map of where uh, our our colleges and universities told us they were interested in developing partnerships and sending Canadian students. So really, a, a global program, um, um, still some degree of flexibility, understanding that the pandemic. Um, required, um, uh, you know, with certain certain unknowns around how things would develop, um, we're still seeing, you know, colleges and universities looking for new partnerships uh, and and um, uh, you know engaging with with those non traditional destinations. Um, to the next slide, I really want to uh, emphasize that. Um, it's really only been since February of, of this year uh, where you know travel advisories were lifted and um, and the government of Canada gave us the green light uh, in order for funding um, related to this program to be used for physical mobility opportunities. Uh, we now have uh, well as of September 30th we have about 1,500 participants um, and uh, notably about 500 of them. Uh, are through virtual uh, means of, of participating. Uh, the large majority of students are uh, underrepresented students, so the, the target group students that we've uh, that we've discussed, um, and we've seen you know really great success um, at uh, you know these virtual opportunities um, being more inclusive, uh, helping students um, participate more. Um, more fulsomely uh, in international study and work abroad, um, but ultimately um, always with that skills um, acquisition uh, lens uh, in in mind. Perhaps one of the things that has been um, uh, perhaps an unintended consequence uh, is that we're seeing a lot of uh, opportunities that are being blended or hybrid. So, um, uh, you know, really that virtual means being a, a stepping stone to physical mobility. And we're, we're now asking ourselves um, if, you know, rather than just being uh, a, a means of participation that reduces access, but in fact, um, perhaps a means of participation that is enabling uh, further opportunities in terms of uh, physical uh, physical travel and, and physical mobility uh, programming. So, uh, you know, we know as a program that we need to continue to think about the, 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 the impact um, in terms of travel. Um, and uh, while while the virtual aspect is certainly one's way to, one way to mitigate, um, there's a lot of thinking about uh, you know how do we move forward and push the boundaries in terms of policy uh, and, and look at ways to green some of these opportunities going forward. So uh, I'll leave. I think that's the end of the presentation. Perhaps the next slide, just to put into context uh, the great participation that we have from our membership uh, in terms of the SDG Accord. It's something that Colleges and Institutes Canada uh, is very um, intentional about. Uh, and would be happy to sort of talk more about this uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, great. So we will move to our last group of presenters um, and we will bring to the stage now uh, Lily Ash, who's a storyteller and facilitator um, with the project and the project manager of Crossing Borders Education for the Sustainable On The Go Youth Engagement Program. And Becky Shute, uh, former director of British Council's Developing Inclusive and Creative Economies Program, 
and a uh, Crossing Borders Education trustee. Dr. Chris Atchison Clare, the director of SILMAR, the Center for Intercultural Learning, Mentorship, Assessment, and Research at Purdue University, and Arnd uh, Wachner. Sorry, Arnd, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name in all of our conversations. <clears throat> uh, Arnd is a intercultural filmmaker and the founder and CEO of Crossing Borders Education. My apologies, Arnd. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks so much, Della, and greetings to everyone, whether it's morning, afternoon, or night for you. Um, just a, a brief <coughs> reminder, if you'd like to take a deep breath now, move your body a bit as we're here on screen, please feel free. I'm going to ask Shirley to go to the next slide and read a brief quote for you. This one says, nothing ever becomes real till it is experienced. Beautiful. So we can actually take our slides down for a moment if you don't mind. So we're really excited to be here to talk to you today about the challenges and opportunities for students collect connecting online. And I've had the pleasure of facilitating um, with the, the CBE workshops for a while now. And I guess CBE is just really here to create transformative learning experiences, particularly for young people using innovative tech, uh, innovative films. And I'm really delighted to be joining my colleagues here to discuss some of the, the challenges and some of the opportunities. And I suppose connecting online is a is a double-edged sword or two sides of a coin, right? It can allow us to all find each other, to show up here together, but sometimes that screen between us can create distance. Or maybe if there are cultural differences, they might be expanded or we know that um, we have comparison when we look at things like social media. And so I'd love to just invite my colleagues in now to talk about how we might be able to address some of those challenges. So Becky, I think you're going to, to kick us off. Yeah, thank you so much, Lily. What a delight to be here. It makes me want to go back to university as soon as possible. And God bless Canada for your strategic joined up approaches uh, in every discipline you do it. So congratulations. Um, greetings from London. Um, I'll start with a challenge, which is we, of course, know all too well how overwhelming the world's challenges can be. They loom over us. Um, and it's very easy to internalize these issues and when we don't support each other to talk about them and to talk about our responses, whether emotional or intellectual, we know that our mental health will suffer. Uh, but encouragingly, we know from our work at Crossing Borders that peer actions or peer-to-peer -peer interactions are vital to nurturing mental health. So by creating safe and intimate but expansive spaces to explore and mess up and to stumble and pause and say the wrong thing and offend everyone and question and wonder and disagree fundamentally in our hearts and our souls, but to come back together and dream together, uh, not least between countries where post-colonialism is still a reality and the global south and global north are still a distinction we need to make. So these spaces to practice skills and indeed to experience them as Gabriella, David and Xavier spoke about are a vital ingredient to positive mental health. Conveniently, they're also the first two steps to systems thinking and system change, which we need for the SDGs. First, deep understanding of self and deep connections with others. Um, and our partner and, and dear colleague, Chris from Purdue University has dedicated her career uh, to this space. So I'll invite her to come in here. Thank you. So one of the lessons that we've learned on a diverse campus like Purdue is that intercultural learning is really intrinsically tied to well-being for students and for all community members. Because first of all, what you've had got happening is that many of the elements and, and components of intercultural competence like self-awareness and emotional management, these elements support people in their own self-care. And then beyond that individual level, the more capable and committed every single person is to practicing all of these elements of intercultural competence like empathy and openness and curiosity across cultural differences, then the more inclusive our groups and spaces become to newcomers and to historically marginalized community members. So when students are engaging deeply with each other in these diverse peer groups and dialogue, then well-being and intercultural skills are mutually supporting each other 
um, and developing together side by side. Um, and, and it's not just for everyone involved in those dialogues, it then becomes, um, it begins to touch everyone else in the community who is interacting with the people who have engaged in the dialogues. So Art, do you have thoughts to add to that? Yeah. <clears throat> When it comes to well-being, thank you, Chris. Uh, when it comes to well-being, there's very often we talk a lot about the negative impact of technology on the mental health of all of us, but especially of young people. And there's really interesting research that's coming out from um, uh, the political scientist Robert Putnam. Uh, he's very well known for his bowling, uh, bowling alone, uh, so how social change happens in society. And in his new research, it's not published yet, but in his new research, that's where he points out that, yes, for many young people, well-being goes down when using technology, but there's a significant group where well-being actually goes up and where he looks at what's the difference between those two groups. And he says the difference is the way technology is used. One group more using, now I'm generalizing, he's generalizing, but research, uh, using technology and smartphones more like a TV, where you become a witness of other people living, passive, and the other using the smartphone like a phone, active, building networks, becoming part of where well-being goes up. So the big challenge to us is, as educators is, how do we create spaces in technology that are interactive, that build networks, that build connection, that build depth of connection. Back to you, Lily. Thanks so much, Arndt, Chris, and, and Becky, just really kind of understanding some of the, the elements that underpin these participatory and transformative spaces we make. But I know that we were all really keen to hear also from the voices of the young people, of the students who who we've collaborated with. And it's been so amazing for me to be in a room with someone in Taiwan at the same time as Brazil, at the same time as Pakistan and Morocco and see these incredible desires start to coalesce of how we might want education to look like, how we might collaborate to do that together. And so I'd love to ask Shirley to bring onto the screen the wee video that we have prepared for this space. Beautiful, so we see that up here and I'd love to encourage folks, uh, if you'd like, you can enter full screen through um, clicking on that little uh, square ticked outline on the bottom of your screen. And then we can go ahead and play the video. Thank you so much, Shirley. We want engaged and interactive learning. We want places that recognize our diversity and uniqueness. We want to exchange modesty and humility. We want to grow our understanding of cultures and values. We want to make incredible relationships through deep connection. We want to incorporate the real meaning of inclusivity in global curriculum. We want spaces that value our inputs and take practical action. We want to establish a safe space. Uh, we want more conversations surrounding mental well-being. We want to enjoy virtual spaces to connect with people from different cultures and learn from it. Beautiful. So we can close that now and just lovely to have the voices of so many of the folk that participated in the youth engagement program here in the space and how incredible that we're all showing up to, I believe, hopefully commit to making some of those desires and wishes a reality. But why don't we talk more about some of the opportunities that we see within online space and I guess how at CBE we're hoping to to kind of address some of these wants and needs. And so thank you so much Shirley for bringing up that slide. I'm going to invite uh, Becky in to, to speak to this. 
Thanks, Lily, and thanks, Shirley. Um, we've seen here a call from students to create a new form of education and to offer a new suite of 21st century skills that are non-negotiable in the classroom and indeed in businesses and in our communities as well. Um, it's one thing to teach these skills. It's one thing to lecture about the importance of them. But as our colleagues before us also emphasized, it's another to help students practice them. So we create spaces, online, virtual, uh, peer-led dialogue spaces to practice these skills. And we do, through, do so through storytelling and listening exercises, uh, through dialogue agreements, through fishbowls, um, which enable us to watch and observe others practicing, oftentimes messing up, but practicing these skills. And that includes these life skills that you see in this wheel here of community belonging, active learning, authentic relationships, and personal empowerment skills we can teach. So although the SDGs are outside goals that loom over us and require technical, business, creative, scientific skills to solve, uh, these inner development goals need to be nurtured as well. And I know we're preaching to the choir in this room, but um, if we nurture these skills, our students can enter any academic setting, any classroom, and feel confident, competent, and humble enough to engage actively in their subject matter. Um, so I'm going to see, I'm going to ask Arndt, how, we, how do, does this work in practice in, in, at Crossing Borders, Arndt? Thank you, Shirley. Uh, th thank you, Becky. And Shirley, can you bring up the next uh, graphic? Um, so there's one force that's actually stronger than parents, than religious leaders, or even media for young people, for teenagers, and that is peers. Um, and that can go either way, as it can, can create destructive modeling when we think of use of drugs or other ways of habits. But it can also model in a very positive way uh, how for each other. And so the slide introduces a bit the methodology we developed uh, for crossing borders. Um, and that is uh, scaled through technology. So we create peer learning processes that are 70 to 80 percent interactive that create deep connections between peers that are peer lit and that are engaging that it create a safe space to practice dialogue that are highly personal and easily scalable. And we, we created that model uh, based on creativity, filmmaking, and transformative learning. And uh, we have the setting that just this year, just this mo last month, we, um, we have the, uh, as and so we scale this, this methodology helps us to scale it to scale personal groups, personal group work, peer led work, but it's really Cisco technology that helps us to, to bring it then from the hundreds to the thousands. And that's where we are um, in this incredible place that Crossing Borders Education entered this partnership with Cisco. And we are right now in a very different relationship learning where we are connecting with engineers at Cisco of the Cisco green team in order to learn from each other. How do we scale the personal dialogue while at the same time also scaling the, the technical side? Over to you, Chris. Yeah. yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges and how they can be met. At a place like Purdue University, which is a very large public STEM university, the challenge, the true challenge is implementing opportunities for intercultural learning and, and well-being support. Um, and you can flip to the next slide just so we see the life skills again. Yeah. So it's implementing all the, the learning that supports these life skills at a large scale. So just to illustrate, Silmar, my center at Purdue, has 12 full-time staff positions, but we serve 50,000 students and 8,000 faculty and staff. And then there's alumni and community members and peer institutions. So we can't directly facilitate learning opportunities for everybody. We don't have the resources. We have to operate on a train the trainer model that builds enthusiasm and expertise in others. But those leaders don't have to be people in formal teaching roles because as, as Arndt was saying, the, the peer learning is so powerful and that social learning that occurs between peers is so effective, we can leverage that power systematically and sustainably to be able to impact a very large percentage of the community 
with the development of these life skills that are framed here in the, in the wheel that you see. So a very real and practical solution is having students lead their peers in these meaningful, personal, very transformative learning experiences, such as the dialogues about resilience that Crossing Borders Education does on the Cisco platform. I'll turn it back over to you, Lily. Hmm. Thank you so much, everyone, for those really moving insights into the need for these spaces and also the, the way in which we are going ahead and organizing them. And, and I was just struck by this idea that it's it's not even just about students, is it? Because students go out into the world, impact their communities that then become the future leaders. And I know there's so much of this conference that's talked about how we actually inspire this this vision that we're all hoping to create and speaking to. And so it's so, so moving to be here and to be thinking about how we craft community connection and empowerment. And so we can take this um, image down now. Thanks, just as we, <clears throat> excuse me, head into the end. We'll leave this quote maybe for the, for the end, but we see it now, so let's roll with it, that we see that very great change starts from very small conversations held among people who care. Obviously, we are all people who care here. That's why we're in this room. And so I'd love to invite you into further conversation with us. If you would like to learn more about any of the work that we're doing, if you would like to maybe give us some ideas, see how we might possibly collaborate, please head on over to our booth where you'll be able to find more information from us. And I think then just for us all to continue to be in dialogue. And I wonder at what point can we, um, can we all step into these types of learning spaces and not just students? So that's something fun to think about as well. And I know we've we've connected with here at CBE. So I think with that, just to say thanks to, to Chris, to Becky, to Arndt for really helping give a sense of, of what happens in these magical spaces. And from my own um, perspective, boots on the ground, the other day, there was someone who reflected back at the end of a session, it feels like I'm home in a room full of people that were from completely different uh, countries that had never met in person. And so hopefully we can all create more of those spaces together. So thanks, up to you, Della. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to all of the panelists today. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone in the audience has any questions, we'll um, be happy to read those out. Um, and I would just like to, you know, thinking about all of the things that you've presented here and all the different ways and um, manners in which we can connect, there's something that I think I feel has become a, a sort of important thread here. And I want to ask um, perhaps, uh, well, anyone who is interested, but why do you think in particular art, whether that be video, film creation, or uh, other, you know, paintings and murals and other kinds of art. Why is that a useful tool or a useful way to encourage uh, intercultural competences and inclusivity? Why? Why is art? I, I, um, I am, I'm having a Spanish moment in my head. But why is that a connection? Uh, an ilo conductor is what I want to say. Uh, that can get us to uh, to inclusivity and and increase intercultural competences. And that would be open for anyone who's interested. I'd like to take a, a shot at that. So I'm Xavier Cortada, as you know, I'm an artist and I've been uh, threading that for the last 30 years in my practice. And what I've learned is, is that um, art disarms, that when you come to a conversation uh, and art is the milieu, the the convener, uh, people are more open uh, to participate and to engage and to, as I said in my little uh, presentation, get out of their silos and connect with others. But importantly, I think we really just have to go back about, I don't know, 60,000, 100,000 years and understand that in every way, art is what made us human. It's what uh, we as a species uh, were able to do as we engage in abstract thinking, as we began to uh, find ways of engaging and communicating with another, what made us communal, what made us interact with one another, the vehicle we use, whether it was sand paintings in Australia or, uh, or caves or just in our language and dance and thought was art. 
And what's happened along the way is that we've sort of lost our connection to art, thought of it as a commodity of something that you hang or display when art is nothing but a, an aperture. It's the beginning of a conversation. So across disciplines, across cultures, across community, the easiest way to convene someone and put down that level of distance between us and them is art. And especially if you look at art in that communal space, it also allows us to imagine, like when you're thinking artistically, you're literally innovating, you're thinking and constructing things you can imagine. So the art that I prefer for us to use when it comes to climate is art that gives hope. So you can imagine a better world where you can actually imagine the change you want to be, but also art that is experiential, where you give agency and therefore hope to individuals who feel distraught because this just seems so large. So communal experiential art that gives agency to me is the perfect vehicle, not just to communicate the science as valuable as that is, but to begin bestowing within individuals their ability to tap into their own creativity to find innovative approaches to a warming world, a warming planet. Thank you, Javier. I don't know if Arnd or someone else has, yeah. That's what I thought. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I would love to come in as a filmmaker because I feel when 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 it comes to art, it it kind of invites us to go in more into a very different place in us, not through the cognitive where we where we follow our bullet point lists and streams and ways of thinking, but it's a very direct access of what's my experience, what do I feel. And there is a very if that another person does it as well from another culture, there's a very, very beautiful bridge happening in the human experience between each other. And so art is there and and then also looking at how religion or you know in the past used art as a bridge. If we could tap into that, uh, use, using all our research, our cognitive knowledge, but using those experiences of art to really bridge between us. Wow, what a powerful pathway. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, I would love to know what's next for the consortium. Um, I don't know if Gabriella, if you can help, like, is there going to be a 26th quote? Oh. Or what's ha what's happening next? Well, I don't know. That would be that will depend on Xavier Cortada, but of course, I mean, this has been very successful. So, a lot of the the good news is that we already are planning to offer this next year bigger, bigger, and I would say hopefully much better. Yeah, for all the consortium members, I think that as you know, this has been very successful. We have been sharing this. Our student has been sharing with this. We had wonderful videos that you cry, right? With the yeah. how they are really living this in the shoes of others. And the most important thing was they made the 25 quote, it's you cry, right? And so I think that I was hearing all of you and this is that's what this what was we think that it is meaningful because in one hour, as Lily mentioned, we are here, we are home. We can be connected like right now, right? Like I see your faces here. <laughs> we all are feeling right, like this is this is our purpose, right? In, in, in having the technology, having these artists with us, we are very blessed to have Xavier Arn, and all of us here. It's, it's, it's incredible, but yes, uh, the, uh, this, it's, com it's, com it's gonna continue and it's gonna be growing. Thank you to the leadership of the Monterrey and of course, all the people behind us that are also joining this uh, event. Excellent. That's great to know. <laughs> um, and I, oh no, no, don't cry, don't cry. Um, <laughs> so I think that we are pretty much out of time. I wanted to thank everyone who has come to attend our session. I wanted to thank all of the incredible knowledge on this panel. Um, we are so interested in what you do next. Um, and, uh, of course, like has been said, I, I hope that this is the beginning of much more network building. Um, and I look forward to seeing what happens next. So I, and I think actually the next thing on the schedule is more art. So this is all, it's all great and it goes with the theme. So, um, please enjoy and, uh, and we'll meet up in the chat later on. I'm sure have a good rest of your day. Thanks so much, Della. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. A big hug. Bye.
Big hug. Bye. <laughs>